Today we're going to have a Pokemon Red pseudo standoff with Tyranitar versus Metagross. The disassembly that I used to make these ROMs that can be found in the description if you're interested in that. There's also some elaboration on the rules that I use for the run, but the very basics is that I can only use my starter in battle, I can't use any items in battle, and the TMs for Double Team and Toxic are banned. The goal here is to do several playthroughs, optimize, and see who comes out on top with the fastest time. And you can let me know what your gut instinct is, who you think will be the winner down below. I'm really interested to see what you guys think. But sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop, and let's just dive into it. I'm going to start with Tyranitar today, and before I cover the stats and the learn set, and you can see the new moves on the side here, before we get to all that, let me go over some initial thoughts. My worry with this project overall was that Tyranitar just would not be competitive. With lower speed and the rock topping kind of sprinkling in problems throughout various points of the game, I thought that this little guy would never be able to compete with a steel titan like Metagross. Now, I have done several iterations of Tyranitar over the years on the channel, including the Paradox form Iron Thorns, and I just felt like I knew how this would go. Now we can just quickly go over the stats, and there's going to be a lot of similarities here. Both Pokemon have monster attack stats, both of their HP and defense adds up to a total of 120, and both special stats are the same. Now let me quickly say that Tyranitar should have 100 special because I use the Chansey rule for my runs, and that just means I picked the highest stat between special attack and special defense, but I made a mistake here, but it didn't change the run, so I'm not going to do anything about it. The worst part about these two Pokemon is that they are not the fastest, and it's just something to kind of pay attention to during the run. Next up is the learn sets, and before we just dive into it, I want to talk about new moves. There's a subset of people that think that this is kind of like a taboo and that you should just start out with things like Tackle and Leer, and let me just say that I adamantly disagree with that stance. I think personally it takes out a lot of fun from these runs, it strips out the flavor of the Pokemon, and ultimately it kind of leads to a dumbed down experience that's kind of antithetical to what I'm trying to do, but that's just my opinion. It is my video. For Tyranitar we'll be using the Gen 9 learn set. The level 1 moves here when they have a bunch of them means that they can just relearn those moves somewhere in the game, but I just kind of take my pick here. I went with the 3 elemental fangs and the god awful Gen 1 rock throw to start off with. I do put a limit on how many new moves I can kind of add in, but things like Scary Face, Smackdown, Crunch, Sandstorm, Giga Impact, they were all left off and we'll talk about the remaining moves later. For Metagross, I went with the Gen 8 learn set. It starts off with new moves like Hammer Arm, which has the hefty self-lowering debuff to your speed stat, and then we got Metal Claw, which is a pretty basic move with a 10% chance to raise your attack, and we'll go into detail in the other moves as they come up, but just know that Gen 9 for Tyranitar, Gen 8 for Metagross, and now that we're on the same page, let's kind of start covering the route. Tyranitar is going to keep it really simple in the early game up to Brock. I do skip all optional battles in Viridian Forest, and I'm still going to pick up one optional battle with the light years junior trainer i don't love this fight specifically and you're gonna see that even with great coverage like the fangs it's still gonna take multiple hits and with the sand shrew having sand attack here in pokemon red it makes this a little risky but the payoff is worth it in my opinion now before we hop into brock let's kind of swap over and see how metagross handles this really early game Metagross is just a really intuitive Pokemon to play, meaning that it didn't nearly take as much trial and error as it did with Tyranitar. Psychic typing notoriously just dominates Generation 1, and the steel typing, it, it just makes this thing a defensive behemoth for the vast majority of the game. Now while you would prefer hard hitting physical moves, when you have an attack stat this high, remember that the special stats are not that bad in these runs, and that's kind of what makes Confusion stand out so much here. I heaped a lot of praise on this move in the YouTube video, and it's going to put in a lot of work today, and other moves like Metal Claw, they're barely going to see any use at all, and then things like Hammer Arm are going to be sprinkled in from time to time as like a finisher. Metagross's route is different from its Kaiju counterpart in the fact that I'm going to be battling both of the optional Bug Catchers in Viridian Forest, and after that very first Pokemon goes down, I'm going to hit level 6 and we're going to get another new move. Zen Headbutt is an 80 base power, 90% accurate psychic move with a flinch chance, but what's important about this move is that it allows me to hit ranges that Confusion just can't quite hit. These two trainers, along with the mandatory bug catcher, they give me the experience that I need, so I'm going to be skipping the Light Years Junior Trainer here, and let's just let's dive into Brock for both Pokemon. Brock. 
There's going to be a very simple blueprint for Brock on both sides. Extra battles let you hit that next damage rounding threshold to not make the fight drag on any longer. And without the two optional bug catchers, Zen Headbutt would only be a three shot on these Pokemon. And that just makes the Onyx a little more risky, probably more risky than you would think. It outspeeds, and let's just say it goes for by turn one. There's a solid chance that I'm not even going to hit all three Zen Headbutts. And then it's just going to hit back with a lethal bide to cause a reset. The two shot ranges here felt much better. Better. And I do have to say that there is still a chance that you can reset. Let's say it goes for Bide. You hit your first Zen Headbutt. You miss your next one. And the Bide only lasts two turns. You could get hit back with lethal damage there and reset. It's a really low chance for that to happen, but there's still a chance. Flipping over, the same principles are going to apply for Tyranitar. With that extra experience, it's a simple matter of just hitting four Ice Fangs, calling in a day, getting your badge. You do face that same Onyx Bide scenario here. And I think picking up extra training early for both Pokemon, it was just a safer approach. And that's going to be both contestants capping off a pretty solid Brock split. Now split data is not too useful right now, I'm not going to bring it up, but just know that only 4 seconds separate these two Pokemon, but let's kind of follow Tyranitar for the next couple of areas. I guess it goes without saying, but this run it has a lot of parallels with the Iron Thorns run, which in terms of cross gen runs, it does rank near the bottom, and why is that you might ask? Well despite the incredible coverage of the Fangs, it's not utilizing that big beefy attack stat. This means that for a little bit, we're going to be using our weaker special stat, and notice that I did just go ahead and replace Rock Throw with Bite for consistency because let's be real, Rock Throw in Generation 1 is honestly embarrassing with its 65% accuracy. It's really bad. Overall the trainers here, they're not an issue, and the only drawback so far is that maybe here and there we'll have to spend an extra turn, but Mount Moon is where we're going to inject just a little bit of extra battles. I'm going to pick up the super nerd and then I'm going to make my way over to the double grass last and then I'm going to make my way towards the hiker to finish up this section. Now this is where the final optimizations come into play and I have to mention Mega Punch. It's a pretty solid option. You usually would grab it because it's going to utilize our attack stat and let us hit pretty hard and I did pick it up for most of my runs but kind of similar to how I let Firo kind of keep up with Dodrio in the last versus run. It was kind of like a necessary trim just for the sake of chasing that fastest time. Now I probably made this sound a little bit more dramatic than it is because in the very next battle you're going to hit level 15 and that will get us access to rock slide. Now this does infinitely more damage than the fangs in almost every situation but Mega Punch did make things a little smoother with the extra power point since rock slide has that stingy 10 pp but at the end of Mount Moon I do hit level 16 and since we have a water weakness it goes without saying that Misty's off the table we could just take a look at rival number two. Compared to something like yellow version, rival number two in red is a menace. The Pidgeotto is just really tanky and it's the sand attack user. It's impossible to outspeed it without tanking your time. And you just pretty much have to hope it doesn't go for sand attack on turn one. If Rock Slide's 90% accuracy goes your way, this one's thankfully really simple, one and done. And like we often see, the fight's difficulty is just going to plummet after that. You do take some decent damage from something like a Vine Whip at the end. But I have to emphasize that Rock Slide can absolutely obliterate anything if it connects and that's what we see here. Next up is Nugget Bridge. and the single highest cluster of mandatory battles are found right here guys. You want to make this as fast as possible, don't get me started. But we have Rock Slide to force through things that can survive, and then we have that Fang coverage. This one goes pretty smooth. Now something else I will call attention to is that at level 18 is our next move. It's Stomping Tantrum, and it is spelt weird. I have Stomp Tantrum, and then it's STMP Tantrum. That's because of character limits, guys. You can only put so many letters in Gen 1. But this does have a pretty cool effect in modern games, but for the purposes of Gen 1, it's just a 75 base power ground move, and it's really solid. Normally, Dig is pretty much your only mid-game ground coverage move. It's a two-turn move, so it's going to balance out to 50 power per turn. So this is about 50% stronger, and it's a great addition to the learn set. But that's going to take us to Misty, but first, let's catch up with Metagross. Not to state the obvious here, but being a Psychic type in Gen 1, starting with two stab Psychic moves, it's really good. And it's what made runs like Mewtwo so dominant. The short term problem for Metagross is that everything we have is going to be resisted by Misty. So just like most slow leveling group Pokemon, we have to pick up a couple of extra battles like we saw with Tyranitar. Things are going to be very similar here. We got the Super Nerd, the Double Grass Lass, and the Hiker. But I do need one additional battle. I'm going to be taking on that grossly overpowered Raticate Grunt. And there's no risk at all here. 
Hammer Arm is a weird move and we'll touch on it a few times in the video, but it's kind of made for situations like this, little one-off situations where it does super effective damage, we can take it out, and when we make it to the end of the route we do hit level 16, and there's a couple of things to cover here. First is Flash Cannon. This is essentially a Shadow Ball clone all the way down to that special drop chance, which doesn't really make sense considering that these moves are physical, but it is a very strong stab move and that extra base speed over Tyranitar means that we're actually going to speed tie the Pidgeotto if we look ahead to rival number two. We don't have super effective damage so it's still going to be a two shot but it goes for quick attack that really does help our odds of not seeing sand but like usual we're just going to see it anyway. All this really serves to do is just kind of like annoy me and waste my time but I don't really miss much at all we can just that's the end of the fight we can keep going. As for Metagross's Nugget Bridge Confusion, it just puts in a lot of work here since there are so many fighting and poison types on the routes. And things like Flash Cannon or Hammer Arm, they can just kind of fill in those little gaps. So let's just jump ahead and let's see how both competitors do on the second gym. Metagross has a bit of an unusual strategy that doesn't really feel intuitive, but it was effective. Hammer Arm has that nasty self-speed lowering side effect, but since we're never going to outspeed Starmie anyway, I'm just going to use it on the Staryu to badge boost myself from Brock's badge. Normally this fight isn't too bad, but here we're going to see a bubble beam crit, but the slow and steady boost from Hammer Arm, it lets us barely outpace. We survive at just 2 HP, and Metagross does get that second badge. For Tyranitar, this fight's a little bit more volatile. We only speed tie the Staryu, so it could do some chip damage, but I do win the coin flip here. And here's some of the lose conditions for Starmie. You don't want to see double bubble beam, try to say that 10 times fast. You don't want to see a crit. And I kind of found the best feeling strat was just to open up with a rock slide and then swap to Thunder Fang just in case she uses an X defend on turn two. But this one actually plays out better than Metagross despite the top disadvantage. And that's pretty cool to see. Just to give you guys a quick overview of how close this one is up to this point, it's only there's only eight seconds between the two, with Tyranitar just holding onto the lead by the slimmest of margins. And let's just kind of zoom it down to the SSN and let's see what happens there. With Tyranitar, a solid time save was just not getting body slam. And this is, I've said this word a few times already, it just wasn't intuitive at all. It's a great move and it's just gonna add to our overall PP reserves, but it just makes the game easier. And I will preach into my deathbed that that being easier doesn't equate to being faster. I think the best approach is to objectively ask yourself why you are doing certain things, why you're making certain decisions, and then ask yourself what it actually helps you do. Things like this, or maybe picking up vitamins, just say, what does this actually do for me? Is that protein and silk flipping a matchup, or did I just waste 30 seconds of time for something that has no impact on the run? I don't know, that's just, those are some things I think about. But here I just pick up the candy guarded by the gentleman, and then then we just we put on a clinic at rival number three there's not really any great commentary here and we're not going to talk about the dark typing that much in this run we'll bring it back up later but just remember that it makes all opposing psychic types completely obsolete and that feels pretty great so let's just jump straight to surge stomping tantrum obviously is going to be the answer here and this is going to look really easy but i feel like since the rock typing is so often paired with the ground type it's really easy to think that electric moves would be resisted or wouldn't do anything here but rock is just neutral to electric which means that something like thunderbolt like a crit here could really hurt a lot i guess technically it is possible to lose this in some magical series of events where maybe you get paralyzed miss some turns and take some crits but surge is over before we catch up with metagross i would like to get ahead of some questions that you might have tyranitar learns thunderbolt it learns a lot of stuff and essentially it's just a better thunder thing so why don't i just learn it the simple answer is that it just it takes time to learn and it doesn't really give me any benefit even even with the Thunderbolt, it would still take two shots to take out the slow pokes and rock tunnel, and it's just easier and save some time to ignore it. Also keep in mind that we're slowly working our way to an all physical set, and all those special moves are great. You're not gonna be seeing a Fire Blast, Blizzard, Surf, Thunderbolt set for this run, and I just kinda hope we're all on the same page. Flipping over to Metagross, I, I need Body Slam pretty bad. That reliable old trusty damage, it's just too good to pass up without it. It's just too easy for Metagross to get walled in some key fights. Specifically, we've already seen water types like Starmie resist everything, and down the line with Charizard being a threat, it could resist a lot of our physical damage as well. In the short term, it does help with things like the Slowpokes and Rock Tunnel, and unlike Tyranitar, 
going through several runs and kind of testing things out. It's just better to get this in the long run. Outside of that, it's exactly the same. Gentleman Candy, lay down the hammer on rival number three, and that's going to take us to Surge for Metagross. Now to keep it short, I can just use Body Slam and win. But something I kind of like came to realize during these runs, during all these playthroughs, was that Steel Typing is kind of like the Daniel and the Cooler Daniel meme with Rock Type. It's just, Steel's just Rock Type but better. You kind of like trade off that fire coverage, but honestly, what Pokemon doesn't get some coverage moves to deal with that? Little Timmy Cup, the rival, will be using Charizard later, and we'll see how far that gets him. But let's not go off the rails, that's another badge down. And let's kind of talk about where we're at. Really quickly, I would like to bring up the sprites and the colors. People ask about this often. And for this video specifically, you just need to know that Tyranitar is using Pokemon Green version sprites, while Metagross is using that Space World 1997 demo sprites. Both runs are using the Pokemon Yellow palette, but this is still Pokemon Red under the hood. I just wanted to get that out of the way real quick. After the Surge split, the optimization to forego Body Slam on top of having a Ground Move for Surge, it has increased Tyranitar's lead to 52 seconds overall, and this is where I have to make a disclaimer about split data. For the next gym, they are going to be the same but after that when you get to like the fifth the sixth and the seventh gym these two pokemon are going to do things in an, an entirely different order so when we get there we're not going to look at the split data because it's not really going to tell you anything but eventually both pokemon will sync back up at a certain point and we'll take a look at it again but all you need to know for now is that tyranitar is just kind of like steadily increasing its lead and we're going to find out soon enough if tyranitar is going to lose steam maybe metagross is a late bloomer maybe it'll turn into a late game monster Monster, but both Pokemon can skip past Rock Tunnel and instead we can pick back up in Celadon to officially kick off that mid game. At this point the routes are going to be very similar. Both Pokemon are going to go to the Rocket Hideout, both Pokemon are just going to ignore the high money items in favor of faster times, and when it becomes to Giovanni, Metagross just has great answers. And this is another situation where you can kind of get a little bit creative with Hammer Arm with some foresight. After you've played the run a little bit, you know that you're never going to outspeed Kangaskhan, so on the right Horn, you can just get that attack boost with hammer arm and you can just increase your chances of one-shotting the little kangaroo at the end i do get the one shot here and i just i really enjoy using hammer arm in this way self debuffing moves are they're pretty rough they're not as good as they look but figuring out how to use them correctly is just really satisfying to me now for the celadon buy metagross just needs a couple of things it needs a little bit of speed and it needs to pick up a sodi pop now it's not picking up that sodi pop to quench its metallic thirst but to get rock slide this is going to allow us to threaten things like charizard and the gyarados menace waiting on us on the rival team and i would argue that this is the most important move in the playthrough probably not but you could argue it as for vitamins three carbos all you need and i do want to note that getting these three carbos here means i will ignore all overworld vitamins from here on out and it just makes sense to me to pick all three up here rather than just slowly accrue them like in the safari zone silfco or pokemon mansion next up is pokemon tower and while the rival battle isn't too interesting in itself I would just like to draw attention to the nice coverage that Metagross has. It's a jack of all trades and this moveset is pretty great right now. And we have these levels under our belt, it means we're hitting really hard. Metagross is kind of coming into its own really slowly, but from there we can just skip the rest of the tower. There's nothing really going on there. From there I head down to Fuchsia and we're going to do things a little bit differently this week. I usually take on Safari Zone instantly, but at our current level we're going to see wild encounters in Safari Zone and in practice I was just bleeding a lot of time, so instead we're going to unlock that flight path we're gonna fly down to fuchsia and i'm just gonna go ahead and take on the gym and the levels that we get here will help me avoid wild encounters later now something else that i would like to talk about it's kind of like similar to the body slam skip with tyranitar i do have a fresh water and i could go to saffron right now and get psychic immediately and it kind of feels like the thing that you should do with psychic types but my friends after just looking through everything it's just a time loss that's it the thing about metagross is that it gets an extremely early psychic via level up and if you just kind of route things a little bit different, you can tackle things like the Fuchsia Gym. You'll be able to get Psychic while still progressing in the game without having to go on any side adventures. And it just saved a solid bit of time on its own. It's probably not interesting to most of you, but for me, the pursuit of getting the fastest time, it's stuff like this, is it's what it's all about. But before we look at Koga, let's quickly kind of catch back up with Tyranitar.
Like I said earlier, the routes are extremely similar, so we can just go over it real quick. I go to the hideout, skip high money items, and Ice Fang, it makes Giovanni a breeze. Tyranitar shopping is quicker than Metagross, just because I don't need any top floor TMs, but I pick up three Carbos just like the other run. It's really coincidental that these runs come out to the same totals, but they just kind of solve a couple of problems down the road. But I must say that this was a really fast and efficient buy here. Pokemon Tower is easy as you would probably expect, but let me just talk about the dangers of the fight. Gyarados is weak to rock, but it's such a tank that it can survive a lot. Now, we're not going to see it here, but Hydro Pump, it's such a huge threat in later fights. Maybe that's foreshadowing. We'll see later. When you also factor in the potential later Venusaur Razor Leaf crits, there are just some challenges to be had. But outside of Ivysaur's 10 out of 10 sprite here in Pokemon Green version, there's not much else to say. Rival number four, Tower, pretty easy. From there, I'm heading south just like Metagross, but today I will be catching the Snorlax. This is something that I rarely do, and generally I only do it for lower tier Pokemon, but with how things kind of shook up and what turned out to be the best path here, it made this a good call, and you'll see why soon. On Cycling Road, I do want to take out this very first biker here. It's extremely helpful to kind of hit experience breakpoints, and before I'm done here, I do want to grab the PP up. I also grabbed the two PP ups before and during the Rocket Hideout section. I forgot to mention it, forgive me, but I did opt to pick those up. We have three total right now. In Fuchsia Gym, I am going to take up one optional battle here. There's a Hypno Trainer. You never fight this trainer. But in this circumstance, it just gives the perfect amount of experience. And we've already talked about the dark typing. It makes this one extremely safe. That's going to catch us up. Let's take a look at Koga. The mandatory gym trainers leading up to this let me hit level 33, and that's when Tyranitar naturally learns Earthquake, and that's honestly all you need to know. I'm a little lower level, and that means that one-shots aren't happening everywhere, but overall, this is a dominant matchup like you would expect, and getting a Koga answer right before or during the Koga fight is going to be a theme for this video, but let's, guys, let's slow it down for a minute. After the battle, I'm going to use three early rare candies. Level 38 is the next damage rounding threshold, but more importantly, I have to shine a lot of spotlight here on the very next new move, and it's Stone Edge. I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. I did not know much about Stone Edge before this video. I saw 80% accuracy, and I just completely wrote it off but I still added it to the ROM because you just don't see much rock move variety and I thought it would be interesting. Now, if you really wanna know my process here, I kinda of comb through learn sets, I make up my mind, and then I create the ROM based off of that before I even test the Pokemon. And after that, I don't play tests and add in different moves if a Pokemon struggles. It is what it is, I keep them as I made them, I guess. So what I'm trying to say here is that Stone Edge's power absolutely floored me and it inspired me to make changes within my overlay code. And I doubt many of you have been here for that long, for years, but we're gonna do a throwback today. We're gonna make a segue back to Math Minute. Gen 1 is weird, and I think most of you know that, but crits and crit damage, they just work different. I'm not gonna gush and sound like Scott Steiner math right now, but let's cover just what I need to. Crit rate is determined by Pokemon's base speed, and the exact formula is base speed divided by 512. Some moves do have increased crit multipliers, which ups the crit chance eight times, which means the new formula will become base speed over 64. With a base speed of 61, Tyranitar using Stone Edge has a little over 95% chance to crit. For crit damage, here's the formula. Don't focus on it too much, but it's two times a Pokemon's level plus five divided by your Pokemon's level plus five. Using level 38 as a barometer, it means that the crit multiplier here is going to be about 1.88 times damage, and it's only going to scale higher as you gain more levels. So now on to the overlay. Let's take a look here. I have a little formula I calculated up. It's going to take Stone Edge's base damage, the crit multiplier, the crit chance, the stab damage, and it's going to give us an idea of the effect effective power of Stone Edge, and you can see right now it's at 274. In hindsight, I should have factored in accuracy, and I probably will adjust that soon, but this math minute, it was really just to let you guys know that Stone Edge is absolutely bonkers, and this single move was the catalyst that let Tyranitar bring itself up into that elite status, but we left Metagross hanging at Koga, I think it's time to catch up with him. I talked about not getting Psychic earlier, and this is why. Zen Headbutt, it's good enough, but at level 34, halfway through the fight, we're gonna get Psychic, and just like Earthquake with Tyranitar, it makes this fight very simple, and it's just a foregone conclusion. This one's done. Now both Pokemon, they're caught up with each other. <laughs> 
Now let's take a look at the final split data for a while because like I said earlier, the routes are going to greatly diverge. And after four gems, Metagross has finally claimed the lead. It's ahead by 1 minute and 27 seconds. And it was behind for all the other splits up to this point. And I, to me, this is where things kind of got interesting. Now we're going to follow Metagross for quite a while. I will be doing the Safari Zone, but remember I'm not picking up any vitamins. We don't really need to look at it. It's just down to business. The first thing I'm going to do is go clean up Erica. And let me talk about her as I kind of make my way there. You might wonder, why don't these Pokemon just brute strength this fight? And sometimes a fight doesn't have to be threatening or hard to be skipped. Sometimes a fight can just waste your time. With our typing, good AI, and the moves that Victory Bell has, it means that there's a pretty high chance that it's going to use Sleep Powder, and it could end up absolutely destroying our total time here. It's not worth the risk, guys. Don't do it. I'm not going to touch on this for Tyranitar, but it is the same logic, but it's more dangerous due to the rock typing and Razor Leaf. But when we actually look at this battle right here, it's going to look very simple. Psychic gives us the ranges. I have Flash Cannon for the eternally pathetic Tangela, and this one, for the lack of a better word, it's a wrap. Silphco is up next, and the slow leveling group, it makes it really hard to skip candies, so I will be going up to the 10th floor. But Metagross, it really needs that Earthquake TM. I do accidentally pick up the Carbos here just due to muscle memory, and I'm gonna you're going to see me in the footage. You're going to see me just throw it away. And on streams, I often get asked, like, why don't you just use the vitamin? Because sometimes I'll accidentally pick up an iron or something like that. And the long and the short of it is it's not needed. It does nothing but inflate our time. But another really important thing here is that this is the point where I'm actually going to use four rare candies. We're going to get up to level 40, and this is going to help me make the game continue to be smooth. Outside of that, there's nothing else, nothing extra, and rival number five is coming up next. This right here is going to be a clinic in how a Pokemon with really good stats, a versatile moveset, and smart uses of candies can make a normally tough fight look pretty trivial. I know some people love to see struggles, some people love fake reactions, but I'm personally more interested in the optimized runs and seeing the fastest times. And specifically for this fight, we just have an answer for everything. The only potential Pokemon that I don't have an answer for that could be troublesome is Execute, but at this level, Flash Cannon is just, it's just good enough. And Alakazam, he might as well be weak to any physical move. And Charizard, he's not quite a threat yet. So the extra levels from the candy, it really helped out a ton here. And we're on to the next one. Sabrina's also not going to be an issue on either run. And the top matchup here, they're going to be fantastic. They're fantastic on both sides. This is a really quick battle. And even though we haven't caught up to Tyranitar, it's just a shame that rival number five kind of locks this gym from being done earlier, or it would have been great for him to come down here. But that's the six badge down for Metagross. It's time for a little vacation. That's going to allow us to take a brisk swim down to Cinnabar, and at this point, we've already done all the prep work. Give us the test, we already know the answers. We are weak to fire, but after kind of taking an introspective look on if Tombstoner, brother, is actually the 28th TM or not, I think we're ready to look at Blaine. Now this fight isn't going to look like much, and I guess you could say that for most fights in an optimized run. It's hard for me to convey how bad these fights felt at first, but let me just say that if you aren't ready, this fight can give you a reset, maybe multiple resets. Remember Blaine does have good AI in Pokemon Red and Blue, and as far as the first three Pokemon go, Earthquake, easy one shot, we outspeed them, get them out of here. Now Arcanine and Fire Blast is where it gets a little dicey, but the level we're at, we can actually tank a Fire Blast if we need to, and one of the reasons for the Carbos was that so we outspeed here, but all of our hard work pays off here, and we just kind of crit and win, but this fight does doesn't look bad, but I think I've kind of conveyed that it could be bad. And this is going to put Metagross at 7 badges. We've stuck with this Pokemon for a little bit, I think it's time to swap back over, and let's see what Tyranitar has been up to. Last time we looked at Tyranitar, it was with Koga. We went over the insane power of Stone Edge, and that's going to lead us to, hey, another brisk swim. We get to see two in the same video, almost back to back, and our rock topping here is going to make Blaine just a great matchup. Here we don't have the speed ranges, we're a little bit under leveled, and it just it doesn't matter. We might take a hit or two there, but just like Metagross, Earthquake can decimate the first three members of the team, and although Arcanine isn't really a threat, this is the first time in the video that we're going to see Stone Edge in action because it's the only way that you can rely get a one-shot and just 
just look at that massive damage. We send the puppy to the Shadow Realm. Next up is Erica, and once again, guys, I just, I want you guys to appreciate that both of these runs, these really high tier Pokemon had to put this fight off. To me, Erica is easily the most underrated gym leader in the entire game. Now, for my money, I think Brock is easily the hardest gym leader, and like, people who know wouldn't really dispute that. So many Pokemon struggle with it. It's just undisputed. But I do think if you could not put off Erica until later, I think the landscape of solo challenges would be extremely different. I, I like Erica a lot. Like, I think she's a really good gym leader, and that's some positivity for the video. The battle looked easy, but you gotta fill the air with something, you know what I'm saying? Tower Manitar is going to take its turn in Sylph, and like we said earlier, slow leveling group, it means we have to pick up that candy on the 10th floor, but we can just quickly get down to business with rival number 5. This one's going to be on par with Metagross, our level's nice, we use early candies, and we just have the damage to make things flow. Once again, Gyarados is a problem if you don't have a plan. If you rush to get here maybe, if you thought maybe you could just get through this and get to Sabrina, you could have a sand attack problem on the Pidgeot, it would outspeed you. But since this run is in the video, you know that it was kind of planned out well. Now at the end, I do go for Stone Edge, and this is not really a necessary risk. I just, I really like the move guys, what can I say? You can tank a Razor Leaf and just go for double rock slide or double earthquake or something like that but we'll see more stone edge later that's gonna bring us to sabrina and if you didn't know i've already mentioned a little bit dark top it's completely immune to psychic attacks that means there's absolutely nothing that sabrina can do to us any wind condition she ever had it's out the window and you really in a perfect world you would not want to do this gym last but it just so happened to be how the dice fell when i rolled them but that gets us the seventh badge and now we're kind of officially caught up on both runs Let's keep the pace moving and go to the final gym. And Tyranitar doesn't need any extra battles here. Now you might be wondering, hey, what about that mandatory fighting trainer in the gym? But with such high base attack, it's just, it's really not an issue. As for Giovanni, the start of the fight with Rhyhorn, it's uneventful. But there is going to be one concession that I made for the run, and it's the fact that I don't outspeed Doug Trio. Now I'm going to touch more on this with Metagross, but you can see here that even a super effective move, it just doesn't do enough to really threaten us. Outside of that, Tyranitar, it's kind of on a dead sprint to the finish line here, and remember that overall red and blue Giovanni just isn't that great, he's pretty bad. With things like Earthquake and Yellow Version, you might have to actually think for more than a second about this fight, but it's just... Here it's just a simple matter of hitting the A button on Earthquake until it's over. We're going to stick with Tyranitar for a few more minutes. I'm going to heal. I'm going to use an elixir that's going to save us a Poke Center visit. And that's going to take us directly into rival number six. And I think this is where we're finally going to see some cracks in this armored Godzilla. PGI is going to be a simple matter. Just use the rock move on the bird. And when it comes to Rhyhorn, use the ground move on the rock top. 2 plus 2 is 4. Put the put the round peg in the round hole. Pokemon's hard. Now we're, we're having a good time. Things are looking easy. Everything's going to according to plan. But being a lower level here, it means that I thought that I would need Stone Edge to hit Gyarados. That's what I thought. And that 80% accuracy is finally going to fail me here. And the worst case scenario is going to play out. Hydro Pump's going to hit me and it's going to crit. And that's going to be enough to send Tyranitar spiraling. He's in shambles. It's going to force the very first reset of the entire video. Hopping back into it, I'm going to go on a slight tangent here, tangent time, and it's going to be about sub 100% accuracy moves and kind of like the stigma of them in the community overall. I think it was what MNJTV that said the phrase, if it's not 100% accurate, it's dynamic punch, and I just, I don't agree. I think a move like Stone Edge and to a lesser extent, something like Rock Slide, they just have so much upside and it's worth it to deal with the occasional miss or occasional bad luck and just Routing these moves off, it is safer, I'll give you that. But if you really want to push a Pokemon, you gotta take a risk, brother. Dare to be great rather than just cowering in your little 100% accuracy safety net hole. But that's all I gotta say, I digress. Now what's funny here, I kind of alluded to it a second ago, is that you don't even need Stone Edge. I don't know why I thought that. Rock Slide would work here. I'm pretty sure it's like a 70% range and I just wanted to go for the higher range. But that's neither here nor there, it doesn't matter. But at the end of the battle, I do go for another Stone Edge. And I'm actually, I'm pretty appalled here that Venusaur can actually survive a Stone Edge, but you do at least get to see us tank a Razor Leaf really fine if you wonder, if you kind of wondered how much damage it would do. But a little bad luck cost a reset here, but Tyranitar, he's pretty much almost set for the league. 
Metagross has to do one additional battle before the final gym. It's to get experience ranges, set up our experience just right. And it's going to be a very easy battle with the Nidorino and the Nidoking. King. It's not interesting, but that extra experience, it is pivotal to get to where I want to be. The Giovanni fight isn't too challenging either, but I would like to touch on Doug Trio a little bit more. In the footage here, I get the patented guard spec by Sylph Cove, so I got a free ride, but I fat finger a rock slide. This opens me up to a dig, and you can see the damage, but let me elaborate more on both Pokemon not choosing to outspeed this Pokemon, and the reasoning overall is going to be that it, it's irrelevant. That's the long and short of it. It doesn't matter. No one cares about Doug Trio. To inject more time, train more, and use finite rear candies or something just to outspeed these three little pieces of sausage, it just just, it wasn't worth it so let it dig let it do what it won't let it eat a guard spec I don't care the rest of the battles whatever as well I have all the answers I need and I can just finish the gym portion of the game really strong and what's really important here what I want you to notice is that at the very end I perfectly hit level 46 and this is where a lot of the optimization kind of comes into play because right after the battle I'm going to use my final six rare candies of the run I can hit level 52 and I can just be a lot stronger in general to avoid losing too much time or maybe even having like a tough time or a reset but level 52 is significant because it's time for the last new move of the run it's meteor mash in later gens this is going to be a 90 base power 90 accuracy move and it's going to get that juicy still same type attack bonus and it carries a 20 percent chance to boost our attack by one stage now kind of like stone edge with tyranitar this move turned out to be much more important than i intended it to be but i will say that it was really fun to use and i gotta say for me personally i assume associate Meteor Mash with Metagross. It's like one and the same. They're synonymous. But it's not its signature move. Maybe some of you think it is because I kind of thought it was for a while too. Even things like the Clefairy line can learn this move. And before we wrap up here, I want to put a full disclaimer here. This move is kind of bugged a little bit in some rare instances. Throughout my testing, I do a lot of playthroughs, testing the ROMs and all that kind of stuff. There were two instances total, maybe out of like a hundred, where you hit Meteor Mash, you get the 20% proc to buff your attack one stage, and then for some reason, the 20% proc procs off the first proc. Say proc that many times, I dare you. It's very rare, but it is possible, and you just might see it coming up later in the video. But let's dive into Metagross taking on rival number six. Without Stab, you just you can't one-shot the Pidgeot with Rock Slide, and that's a little bit discouraging, not gonna lie. But I do go for Meteor Mash, and overall I'm just kind of unsuccessful at fishing for a boost. Rhyhorn is next, and Meteor Mash is gonna be super effective, so it's the right play anyway. It does its job, but there's no boost. Execute's gonna come in, and it does take neutral damage from Steel Move, so Meteor Mash, and you guessed it, once again, no boost. We're 0 for 3. As for Gyarados, Rock Slide is gonna be the clear play, but I don't think it can one-shot, and I'm kind of desperate for a boost. I don't know why I want to boost so bad. I don't even need it. So I go for the resisted Meteor Mash here, and finally, after four tries, I do get that attack boost. Now, what this boost does here, it makes an already pretty simple and straightforward fight already over with, unless you miss moves. And it doesn't happen here. Now, this fight was one where I didn't plan on boost. I kind of like planned around it, used the Carbos, I outsped the Charizard naturally anyway. But sometimes you gotta, you know, take a step back and just realize, hey, fishing for boost and seeing that attack raise animation, it's, it's fun. But that's over with, and I think we can just take a real quick review before we get towards the end. Both contestants, they're ready for the final challenges of the run, and it's been a while since we've seen that split data, and let's see where we're at. Now keep in mind that the Elite Four start split at the bottom here is when you load Lorelei's room, but going into that point, we're a mere one minute and 58 seconds. That's all that stands between the runs, and it's pretty tight right now. Maybe some bad luck here, or maybe like a killing spree with Stone Edge, it could make all the difference, but there's really only one way to find out. Now you can see what I mean when you look in the middle here. You should only pay attention to the final splits and the first few splits because in today's video there was just a completely different mid game order after Koga and then eventually those runs kind of converged back at Giovanni and you might be saying hey Matt why not just do like ordered numbers rather than focus on the specific badge maybe I could I don't know honestly I hate manually entering split data if you didn't know I got a, a piece of software that kind of automatically records certain parts of the game and just automatically puts the time in a spot it automatically takes the two times and subtracts them from each other and it makes things very easy for me but if you didn't have that it'd be very tedious and I'm gonna tell you guys right now I'm not gonna stay up until 1 in the morning calculating the time difference between 10 Pokemon runs like a nerd I really like the efficiency that the software gives I think it does the job that's neither here nor there 
I don't even know why I'm talking about it. So to quickly go over what happens for both Pokemon leading up to the Elite Four, Metagross does nothing. It just goes straight to the Elite Four, it skips the Victory Road Rare Candy, no training, and it's just ready. Tyranitar does use all of its remaining candies after Rival Number Six. I'm not gonna show the footage, it's me using candies. But that's gonna get it up to level 53, and the only moveset change that we're gonna see is that Tyranitar got access to Hyper Beam at level 52, and it's gonna replace the obsolete Stomping Tantrum, but this one's really close. I'm excited to see how it plays out. I think it's time we get down to business and see who comes out on top. Metagross in general has a pretty great matchup here, but this is where we're going to see that bug I talked about earlier. It's kind of hard to see, I'll slow it down, but the Meteor Mash attack raise is going to proc off of itself and I instantly get growled to offset that. In a perfect world, my code would work flawlessly, but it's only about a 4% chance. It is what it is, I'm not too worried about it. When Steel Type was created, Game Freak just gave the middle finger to the already weak Ice Type for no reason at all, but the Mash is pretty much neutral for the most part in this fight, but to make things go smooth, you one or two boost. I pick up my second boost pretty early and that makes things smooth for a really solid start for the Steel Titan. I almost tongue tied myself there. Let's move it over to Tyranitar and Rock is super effective to Ice so to make things even better we have a 100% guarantee with only Rock Side to take out the Dugong. No need for Stone Edge yet. Where weak to water Pokemon generally struggle on this fight is the monster defensive stats of Cloyster and the highly underrated Clamp signature move but Stone Edge guys that's all you need to know. I love this move and it's enough to even bring Cloyster to its knees with a single shot and that's just it's really impressive to me. Now if you didn't know Cloyster has about 792 for its base defense stat and it can just be a wall to a full offensive set or full physical set I should say but Slowbro and Jinx they don't stand a chance and Lapras is where you could have some bad luck. If you're at full health you can afford to miss a stone edge you can tank the impending hydro pump barring that it doesn't crit but I connect here and we have two solid starts to the Elite Four. I'm actually going to skip Metagross's Bruno fight. I just use Psychic five times and one-shot everything. It's not interesting, but to this point, it's it's very rare to see fighting types in Gen 1, and our boy Tyranitar is double weak to fighting, so is today the day where Bruno gets the fire in his eyes and he rises up to take down his white well? The answer is going to be no, but let me tell you about some practice leading up to the final run. There were some runs where Machamp would just always go for submission. I think one time he went for it three straight times, and it can pretty much one shot you. There was a point in routing this run where I was just considering to level more, move battles around, use extra candies, and just get up to like level 58 or higher. But we all know Bruno, he has bad AI. And if you dangle that filet mignon right in front of his face sometimes, he's just too stupid to take advantage of it. It is what it is. Another week of Bruno. Agatha is pretty interesting for both runs, and by interesting I mean it's just a roll of the dice and it can be really frustrating. All you need to know is that there's no feasible way that you're going to outspeed the Gengar, and you can get outcomes like this where you just get put to sleep immediately, never wake up, and you just get taken out from 100 to 0 with, with no counterplay, and I just I have to say how fun that feels. It's so, it feels so good. Jumping into the next attempt, you are going to see that the last reset was pretty much the one and only lose condition for this fight. If the Gengar doesn't get extremely lucky with Confuse Ray procs or it doesn't hit Hypnosis, you're just going to roll over this fight and it's extremely easy. There's nothing you can really do about it, so you just kind of have to eat resets like this. For Metagross, you can see that I don't really fear this fight. I come in missing some health, but it was more about me just trying to save a little bit of time rather than just be cool, I guess. But maybe this is a little uh, foreshadowing for you. I start off by avoiding Hypnosis, but I get hit with Nightshade. Combined with already being hurt, it takes me really down to the yellow health. It doesn't feel great, but just like Tyranitar, I'm going to outspeed the next few Pokemon. I'm going to take them out with ease, and this one is looking like a done deal, but Agatha, she hands me the dice, and she tells me to roll again. There's honestly not much commentary here, and I don't want to come off as being like frustrated 
or negative, but Confuse Ray, I hurt myself two straight times, and then I got finished off with a nightshade. It just, it feels bad. Not as bad as like a first turn hypnosis and not getting to play the game at all like Tyranitar, but it's still one of those kind of like, oh cool moments. And you just gotta keep going, and let's just dive into the next attempt. And this is gonna be really similar to the last attempt, outside of an early swap to the Golbat. I even take an early nightshade again, going down to 90 health, just like last time, and then we sweep everything. But the difference here, it's really just another example of why Agatha can be so frustrating because it goes for a bad move and I just win really easy. I hate that there's no middle ground here for strategy. It's either you win or lose, especially when you don't outspeed the Gengars, but it is what it is. Both contestants get a reset here and now it's on to Lance. With Tyranitar, you could play it safe, you could tank a Hydro Pump, use Rock Slide, but what's the fun in that? This is going to be the Stone Edge show, and you already know that I'm going all in. I connect, and the Water Snake is thrown out of the sky in one single hit. Now from there, this is actually where Hyper Beam had the most use. It just lets me use the beam, I can beam down the two Dragonairs, and it just pretty much serves as a fast forward to get to the back end of the fight. Now I want you to watch a pretty fairly frustrating moment here. It seems like I've had a lot of these so far, right? Here's what Aerodactyl does. Supersonic hits, 55% chance, and then I go on to hit myself two straight times at a 50% chance each, and then I miss two straight rock slides with a 10% chance to happen on each of those. Now in a vacuum, the chances of all of these things happening back to back to back to back is a little more than 0.13%, a tenth of a single percent. And all I can conclude is that there's some spiritual force out there that just wanted me to have a bad time, but not today, devil. You're going to need that 0.00013% chance to hold Tyranitar down. But maybe I spoke too soon. I didn't even realize this until I was editing. But at the end here, I'm still confused, and I hit myself. And then Dragonite gets a crit on Hyper Beam, and I barely survive at just 8 health. And at this point, I'm kind of like saying stuff to my screen that I'm not going to repeat in a video. But luckily, I do hit the Stone Edge and win, so I don't have a mental breakdown. Now this one was pretty wild, and it does suck that Lance wasted so much of my time here, but it happens. It's Pokemon. Metagross has a range to one-shot the Gyarados, and most likely it's going to survive and get a move off, but here I just get the crit, it's one and done, and now I'm on to the next one. From there I can just safely just fish for boost, but I do go for Rock Slide on the first Dragonair on accident. Now I get the boost on the very first mash, and I don't get another one on the next Dragonair, but that's essentially going to be the fight over. If you get two boosts, you can one-shot the Dragonite. So one boost essentially doesn't really do anything here, but since Tyranitar lost about 45 seconds on Lance, Metagross just cleans up and there's only going to be one remaining battle. I'm going to stick with Tyranitar since it's about two and a half minutes behind, and it's going to be about as straightforward as it gets at the start. I see a bird, I throw some rocks, they teach you this kind of thing in first grade, don't they? Up next, we are a really hard wall to Alakazam, we've said it multiple times, it's not really worth going into, and Rhydon is really tanky, so it does take a couple of non-stab earthquakes to take it out, but it uses a tail whip and we get a little badge boost for our trouble. Now my friends, for this fight to be as fast as it can possibly be, I need to hit three straight stone edges to close things out. Out, which is basically going to be a coin flip in terms of odds and how the last fight went I think Tyranitar is due some luck. So let's see what happens. I hit the first Gary goes down I hit the second one on the thick puppy But can we get three and the answer is no we can't I miss and I get hit with a razor leaf here by the best sprite in the entire game If you don't know about green versions Venusaur sprite take in all of its glory right now But we are at full health. I can tank it I do hit the stone edge and that means Tyranitar is gonna clock in with a final time of two hours two minutes and 44 seconds and let's see if Metagross can maybe fumble the ball or if it just finishes strong. Metagross has a pretty clear plan here and it's getting a boost later in the fight. That's the goal. I play it cool here, toss some rocks at the Pidgeot and I mix it up a little bit on the Alakazam. Now the real reason to go for Meteor Mash here is because it's my strongest move and boosts are just a side effect of that and just like the rest of the Elite Four, everything is coming up Millhouse for Metagross and I get the boost. I accidentally go for Earthquake on the Rocky Rhino but it can survive so it gets a full restore and Metagross says, hey, one boost, not enough, give me another. Meteor Mash turns right on into dust and now I'm at plus two. Now the worst part of this fight would be Executor and this is where plus two helps, but it's not the main thing. 
I miss, and then I get the one shot on the next turn, but I leveled up after the ride on. So here I'm gonna need a singular boost to outspeed Charizard and Metagross. He has those loaded dice. He tosses them out and I get the third boost of the fight. And that boost is gonna put the final nail in the coffin because I already had the damage. I just needed that little bit of extra speed on Executor. And from here, it's just a matter of hitting two rock slides to finish off the run. And with the luck we've already had so far, there's just no doubt that this is gonna be an easy task for the Steel Titan. And two flying types are gonna meet some rocks to end the run in a dominant way. Metagross finishes the run with a 2 hour and 11 second time, and it's the clear winner today. Even with a perfect Lance fight, Tyranitar would still be behind, but I have to give some praise to Tyranitar because I did not think it would even put up this much of a fight, so I'm happy with the results. Metagross gets a tier card ranking of 96.04, and that puts it pretty solidly high on the tier list, and Tyranitar gets a 94.18, which is nothing to be sad about. And if any of you are watching and you're wondering where I pull this number from, I do give the formula and go through it in an unlisted video in the description. So let's pull up that tier list and there's gonna be no changes at the top, no one's surprised. These runs are just so dominant. They're pretty much in a league of their own, so I would be shocked if something could ever step up to challenge these runs. But when that second page does roll around, there's a couple of things to note. Now look at the top line here. Generation three is kind of holding it down outside of Scale of Dirge, kind of hanging in there. But Metagross did make it into the top 10 at a solid number nine, but Tyranitar really isn't that much lower at a very respectable number 12 spot. Now this video took quite some time to get out. I originally wanted to get this out in December and I started like working on pieces then but the whole process of just like making and troubleshooting two custom ROMs, playtesting them, and then doing all the playthroughs and optimizing, it took so long. And that's not even like considering things like editing or voiceover or all that kind of fun stuff. I will say that Tyranitar was a bit of a challenge. It took me about seven playthroughs to get this high tier result, while Metagross only got four total playthroughs. And I kind of went over that at the very start of the video. But I do hope you enjoyed this style of content. And if you made it this far, you're a real one. I do appreciate that a lot. Comment that down below. If you're new here, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Tons of Pokemon, you already know. But special shout out to my channel members. The support means a lot. And the few of you that are still around during this little talking period here, I genuinely want to know what you think about these kind of like evolved versus top videos. I don't know how many of these I could feasibly make at a certain pace, but it was fun. And I guess all that really matters is if I had fun and you thought it was good. But that's about it for me. I'm going to try to make sure this thing stays under an hour. I've been talking for a while and I guess I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.